I, I wanted to just start by briefly saying, after the dancing is over, First of all, it's amazing to be here, back in the physical world again. And I, I don't know about you, but one of the reasons I came to DLD as my first debut back into the world of human contact was because I really wanted to get a sense of this post-pandemic zeitgeist, we hope post-pandemic. And I really feel that I've been picking something up here quite distinct. Obviously, DLD has always had extraordinary optimism that optimism about technology's possibility remains here today. But I feel, and obviously the programming is determinative, but I think it's, it's something that's bubbling up, a much greater sense of the responsibilities around technology that people are feeling coming out of spending 15 months in their homes. And I think that's very interesting and quite promising, and I hope I'm right. Uh, so this session, is, as Steffi said, really focusing on medical technology. Uh, Laura, welcome from Arizona. And just for those few who might not know this, there are two Mercs. Laura does not work for the Merck Pharma Company headquartered in New Jersey, but for the original Merck from which the other one was split off in the 20th century for reasons that are complicated. Uh, but it's a <laughs> German company with all kinds of businesses. Um, and Laura, maybe a good thing to do would be for you to quickly just summarize some of the businesses that Merck is in because they're diverse and they interrelate in interesting ways. Absolutely. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I do wish I was there in person. So, so the next time, um, that, that is my commitment. But in the meantime, I'm really happy to participate. And um, Merck has had a, a long history um, with the DLD conference. Um, the, so within Merck, we have three divisions. Um, the healthcare division, which really enables kind of the future of healthcare in um, serious diseases, as well as kind of bringing the dream to parents of, uh, bringing the dream to people of becoming new parents. Um, in life sciences, we're really fueling the biotechnology and scientific research uh, community. And then in electronics, we, we always say we're the company behind the companies advancing digital living. And the one thing I would say that's really interesting and kind of sounds like the theme that's going on today is I think before the pandemic, we knew that these areas of science and technology were important. But as we look today um, and we, we see the electronics division enabling the work from home economy, we see our life science division, division partnering with vaccine developers and really becoming a critical enabler. And then the healthcare um, obviously being a, a critical part of how we go forward for societal and global health. Um, this becomes ever more important. And we really think that science and technology is at the heart of what we do. And we really wanna be part of, of the way forward. And we hope that this is you know, kind of a new dialogue that's coming around how we advance uh, technology and science faster. Good. Well, that's, that's a great start. I know that one of the, you know, in the course of the work that you guys do, both in developing drugs, but also in helping to target the delivery of drugs made by others, you do a lot of work around targeted therapies, particularly for cancer. And we know that the genetically targeted therapies are really the biggest breakthrough we've had in cancer treatment in, in the last decade or so. Um, Talk a little bit about the work you do in that area, and then I want to talk about how technology dovetails with it. Absolutely. So I think this is um, you know, one of the most exciting uh, areas we, we see as kind of enabling the, the future of healthcare, um, specifically for drug and vaccine discovery. Um, bringing in artificial intelligence and machine learning into the data analysis for our, our emerging drug discovery um, has been has been critical for our advancements. And we see it in a couple of areas, and I'll kind of break it down from kind of the, the starting point to where we see this, where we see this evolving. So first of all, with all the digital, with all the data that we now have access to, even from our own um, development, we can now start to mine this and identify high probability drugs for the, the future um, therapies. And so this becomes really kind of helps us accelerate the drug discovery and also gives us a higher probability and confidence in our 
early success for clinical trials. Um, the, as we go forward, what we also are now looking at is how do we use computational simulations to really identify within, really identify the best candidates starting out. And this helps us to reduce the synthesis time, um, to really focus on the candidates that are the most impactful or have the highest probability of success. Now, of course, ideally, we can do most of the simulation for the ideal drug in, in computer simulations. And so this really accelerates the timeline for targeted um, cell and gene therapy, as you said. However, that does then kind of pull on some um, improvements in the computational side as well. And that's, that's where our electronics division comes in to really kind of be a partner there in helping fuel some of those, those advancements. Yeah, one of the things that I was most struck by in, in our conversation as we prepped for this session was how eager Merck is for computational speed and capacity to grow much more rapidly, even to the point that you talk about quantum computing being used right. in even things like targeting the exact drug and predicting drug interactions for an individual based on their genetics and the genetics of their disease, of their cancer. So just is, is, is quantum something you really think will happen that will transform medicine? Yeah, so I, I, think, we're, I think we're already, we're seeing some um, early, early um, papers come out and research, uh, IBM research has published where they can now simulate uh, using quantum computing the uh, protein folding. Um, and of course, that's a, that's a critical aspect to really identifying um, what, what a drug can, can in, how a drug interacts with specific proteins. Um, what we see in terms of quantum and also neuromorphic computing, kind of advanced computing, is they will enable these really very complex simulations to become more and more um, common, and that will enable further advancements in the, the drug discovery. And so over, to, over the next decade, we really see these two advancements, the drug discovery um, using you know, and being enabled by AI combined with the advances in computing, really kind of enabling the, the next um, level of, of drug discovery. And we're very excited to be part of that, especially with the different technologies that we develop within Merck. Now, you talked at the outset about technology, the convergence of a lot of technologies, but specific, right, just quickly, and I want to go to Stefan, but before we do, what technologies in particular are you most excited about seeing converge right now? Uh, well, one, one area that I, I kind of touched on, but I think it's, it's important because it's, it's uh, basically leveraging some of the science we understand about the brain for advances in computing. So if we look at the traditional uh, architecture, it's called von Neumann architecture or von Neumann architecture for computing. Um, this is very good for complex simulations, but the difference with AI is it's a lot of pattern recognition. And so this requires multiple um, trains of information to go back continuously, more like your brain brain works, where you've got synopsis firing um, continuously. And so the neuromorphic um, future chip designs really leverage that understanding of how the brain works to enable faster AI simulations and also more energy efficient. So that's one area where we see us learning from how the brain works to enable kind of future technology innovations. Thanks, so neuromorphic being chips that allow multiple pathways of data to sort of travel simultaneously, sort of like the exactly. neurons do in the brain. Okay, Stefan, um, first of all, you're the CEO of Brain Lab. Quickly tell us what Brain Lab does, just to get set the context. Okay, brain of digitized surgery. We started in neurosurgery, as that was one of the subspecialties to first adopt uh, sophisticated computer-driven technology. It's uh, basically some sort of GPS system for the human body, which we use to make uh, treatments more precise, less expensive, and more effective than traditional therapies. And while we really have expanded greatly in neurosurgery, about 6,000 hospitals worldwide use our technology. In the meantime, we have also evolved into areas such as spinal surgery and oncology. And um, so with our technology, which is all computer driven, of course, there's a lot of data that our customers use to optimize their treatments. But almost like as a byproduct, there is 
tons of data that is basically being generated that today is somewhat uh, you know, unused. And um, while there is um, just an explosion of, of data, um, the, uh, we have really seen, in especially the last year, that healthcare is really important, something we've taken for, for granted. And you know, here in Europe, we probably have the best healthcare system. So I think that was, I'm actually very glad that I was able to live through the pandemic in Germany. And so if we're able to continue to digitize that, and I think um, the digital transform transformation has accelerated over the last uh, you know, year or so, um, this is a tremendous opportunity and just the beginning, like the motto of this conference. Well, it's interesting that both your companies are involved in sort of achieving greater exactitude in the treatment of various diseases, particularly cancer. Uh, and I know, you, as you mentioned, data is deeply important to you. And it has been striking to me, in line with what I said at the outset, how much data has come up today in, and the ethics around data and the manner of using data and the the, the questions of whether Europe is or is not over-regulating data. I was struck that the uh, EU um, guy was, in general, agreeing with Andy, I think, that the AI laws may be uh, misconceived. Um, I know you, Stefan, are deeply concerned about some of those issues, so talk about what you're worried about regarding the way data is treated in Europe right now. Well, I think it, uh, Europe is regulated, although the idea is maybe right. I think that when we um, look at the comparison that was presented earlier this year, uh, earlier today, that uh, basically the U.S. is made different than China, I think Europe has a fundamental different value system, and I think for a good reason. And uh, you know, being a European company and having grown up in that value system also has its benefits, and I think that. Um, there was some criticism about the GDPR, but it's the right idea. And if we can leverage that and uh, make that something we use worldwide, that's a good thing. However, I think we need to uh, make sure that we don't go overboard. And uh, the missing part maybe in a, in a public debate is about under which circumstances would data also be shared and used by industry. So a lot of the discussion is using data for research. That, of course, every patient thinks sounds like a good idea. So, and the majority of patients, in fact, you know, excel, like more than 85% would be happy to volunteer data for research. But what exactly is research? It's not just the clinical research that a hospital does or maybe a, a fundamental scientist uh, doing some physics projects, but today 70% of the research is really um, spent, especially in the space, by companies. And although in the public debate it seems like um, companies are excluded, there is a data science center in Germany that is set up, and in the current German regulations, companies are barred from um, accessing that data. Really? And uh, so for that reason, I think it's important to initiate and start a, a public debate if and under which circumstances would companies be allowed to, to use the data. I mean, I don't want to give, as a patient, maybe my data away to a company that would just go and sell it off to the highest bidder. But if a company would take my data and generate value-driven products that you know, help to uh, cure cancer, then that's a good idea. And so how do we come up with the right um, regulations and rules that don't go overboard, but that set maybe a couple of basic, uh, you know, say, frameworks and, uh, and uh, rules that we can adhere to um, is probably something that needs to start with a public debate. It can't come from the government, but it almost needs to involve all you know, elements of society and put the patient in the center. Well, I think you have an ally in the member of the European Parliament who spoke earlier, Axel. I mean, he was saying some very similar things. Uh, and I even went over to you and I said, hey, this guy is like echoing a lot of your points because I know you, you've been frustrated. You're actually showing less frustration on stage than you did to me privately, but, but um, and, and let, let's just quickly go there because I know you are concerned that if these things, these, these approaches to data don't change, that Europe really could be disadvantaged in future medical research vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China. So just quickly talk about that. Well, you know, I think that uh, um, in the U.S. it's uh, basically just even technically easy to donate your data. It's completely unregulated. So, and in fact, there's also uh, something called the uh, 
um, information blocking rule of the 21st Century Cures Act, which basically means every patient by law has access to their data and that access is uh, provided electronically. So more or less on the mobile devices at the press of a button, they can control their data. So in, in other words... In theory, let's just say, as an American, that's not happening right now, I don't think, but go on. <laughs> no, yeah. but this is just something that has been implemented it, now. It's and an I think aspirational it, goal, they want to make it happen. Yeah, right, go on. Go yeah, on. but I think it will basically uh, trigger a very different development of a, right. of a range of companies that now will start uh, uh, using that. And I think while in Europe, you know, we're still at a very early beginning of that debate. And uh, one of the uh, dangers is, again, like the overregulation of that. And another provision being discussed, we, you know, we talked today about the regulation on AI. There's also the Data Governance Act that is discussed, which has a number of good elements. But also, at the same time, it basically provides a isolation from people that um, you know, hold data and people use the data. So in other words, if you're a data intermediary trying to facilitate access of data to others, you're barred from using it yourself. However, innovation in healthcare is, um, you know, doesn't work this way. Once you start trying to use data, you realize what's wrong in the data pro um, uh, yeah, generation process. So basically, if you don't have the opportunity to go along the whole pathway, understand how data is put together, and deploy and apply innovation in the entire data valuation and a data creation pathway, then you can maximize the use of data, which of course would be the case in the US, that would be also in China, and I think if we can't allow that in Europe, then that would be a problem. So the European regulation is modeled like something like FinData. It's a government-run um, organization that takes a lot of the data and makes it available you know, publicly, which is a great thing. But it can't be the monopoly for how companies can access data, yeah. because that would really cripple um, basically our, our data economy and so for that reason, I think we can't just take one model and generalize it to the only way of how data in the future can be accessed. I think it's interesting, a conference in Europe where that message has come up on this stage at least three times today, so, or on the TV screens. Uh, so Laura, um, I quickly, what's, I know Merck operates globally. When you look at this question of geographic competition regarding healthcare progress, how do you think about it? Yeah, so, so we do, we operate uh, in all major global regions, in, including Europe, US, and, and China. And so we're, we're um, collaborating with, with the different countries and, and regulatory officials continuously. Um, I think maybe one, one element of the conversation that I wanted to bring in is, is it's not only the regulations, that, that's an element of it, and obviously different countries have different perspectives on that, but it's also actually the investment um, for the data infrastructure. And that's something that we see um, equally kind of challenging um, because it, you know, much of this data is still analog. Um, the databases are disparate across healthcare um, providers. And so it's not only the regulatory kind of um, perspective in terms of how to, how to um, you know, have ethical use of the data, but it's also how to make sure that the data is, um, there's a foundation for the data infrastructure. And so we do see some um, regions investing in that more, more than others, um, specifically China you know, is making investments in that area. So I think that data architecture and foundation is equally critical as we talk about this. Now, the two things that I would say we're doing in America and we've seen with, with some um, level of success, the first one is because we do operate globally across these regions, we do have a digital ethics advisory board um, that we put in place and we brought scientific error experts across both the, the healthcare side and, and digital side to really kind of debate how we use data and make sure that we're advancing the scientific understanding while also making sure to take care of, of patient sensitivities. Um, we have a uh, joint venture with Palantir that uh, the, the name is Centropy. It operates independently from um, our other three business sectors. And that really is to address some of these uh, data foundation aspects where we can collaborate with cancer centers and, and 
um, establish a data, data foundation or, or data lake that researchers can use. Now, what I will say, what's very important in this model is that we do not own the data. The data is accessible. The data is owned by those that generate it. And the researchers have the ability to determine basically who can um, access and, and use the data. Um, and really, it's just creating that, that architecture so that the data can be um, used for scientific advancements. And so I think that, that foundation is a way that we can start to um, enable collaboration without, um, you know, while still meeting the, the data ethics standards. You would have been interested in hearing the person from Snowflake uh, yeah. on stage earlier today because th this idea that Snowflake could really enable a data marketplace, which wasn't really being applied to healthcare, but if it were applied mm -hmm. to healthcare, that would really advance what you're talking about. And there's plenty of other issues to follow up, but I know Stefan yeah. had a reaction. Go ahead. A, a few things. First of all, I think having a company board on data ethics is great, but it's not good enough. I think we need to have a fundamental society consent on um, how we conduct uh, data needs to put in the patient to the center. So I would also disagree that the researcher can determine what is done with the data. It should be fundamentally decided by, uh, by the individual and the patient, and uh, it needs to be done in a standardized format. So I think standardizing patient consent is uh, you know, very important. And I also believe that, yes, we do need a data infrastructure, um, that is suited to that, but form follows function. We need to first come up with what is the methodology and how we want to share and use data, and then I think we can effectively build that infrastructure to, uh, to facilitate that. And so, again, I think that Europe might have a second mover advantage. I think that many countries have uh, basically also started to model their own data rules um, after some of the principles of GDPR. And uh, so, basically, while Europe is behind, and uh, I, I, I'm, as an entrepreneur, I'm, opti I'm an optimist as well. And uh, so it's the beginning of hopefully, you know, driving uh, progress in healthcare forward with data, but with data ethics made in Europe. Thank you. I was going to make a joke about whether we were about to get the gong, but I want to just, now that Laura's finally, her image has gotten clear, you know, you were kind of distorted before. And now that we can actually see you, I want to ask you one last question. I know you're pretty, you're pretty upbeat about some of the changes about research funding that's coming out of the White House and, and Congress right now. So just quickly talk about what you see happening in the U.S. and how it may have differed from what we've had up until recently. Sure, yeah. So I, uh, I, I spend a lot of time in this area. Um, what we've seen over the past two years is kind of a realization that semiconductor manufacturing and electronics manufacturing are a critical national um, priority. And so we've seen uh, significant funding and commitment coming out of, of the US uh, from the White House. Um, and this you know, has very um, good bipartisan support. We've also seen the same thing coming out of Korea, coming out of um, EU in terms of, of government support. And so I think this is addressing the fact that you know, the advancements of technology specifically in, in electronics are a critical national priority. And I think this is exciting because that will help us advance the types of computing that I talked about. Great, well, thank you. And we did get the gong. So thank you from <laughs> Arizona. Thank you, Stefan, here on stage. Thank you to all of you.